It's a great privilege for uh, my wife and I to be here. We have uh, greatly enjoyed uh, the dialogue, discussion, being part of the debate. I want, uh, if I may, to, uh, to take our discussions on uh, to the next stage. I want to use the example of sustainability and how our world is responding to this really important issue as a, um, a way of thinking about the common good and how we can change our world, our entire world. Okay, so that's my agenda. It's very simple. And uh, uh, in doing that, we will consider the $40 trillion green technology boom and how this is playing out for the common good. Okay, so we, we will look at an alignment of moral force, of economic logic, of business requirement, and of political will uh, to change the future. And I believe that if you think about sustainability as an issue, of course it is about the common good, isn't it? But it's only part of the common good because it doesn't talk, for example, about child labor. It doesn't talk about social justice. It doesn't talk about the health inequalities in the world. But it's a start and it's a good start if we can bind seven billion people alive on the world today in one single cause, which is the protection of our planet and the, and the correct use of our resources, then I'd say we have made a good step towards a more general common good. I began my career as a physician looking after people dying of cancer at home. I then uh, uh, became involved in another illness, HIV, which was killing many people in my country. And my wife and I began a foundation in our own home in 1987 as a result of seeing people dying badly, really badly, in our own national health system. And we began to train people from churches from all denominations in our local part of London to be the hands and the feet of Jesus himself, to do what doctors should do, to do what nurses should do, and to show love, compassion, and understanding, and at the same time, bring a life-saving message into schools. And that movement grew very fast. Soon, within two years, we were in Uganda, Romania, Thailand, and now today we are in more than 20 countries. I learned two things. This was before I got involved in consulting. Today uh, I can fly in one week from an event with Google looking at their future of digital world, and then it might be the following day with ExxonMobil looking at the future of energy, and one day later with the European Commission looking at the future of leadership. But back in those days, my world was different. I learned two things. Firstly, life is short. And life is too short to do things you don't believe in. Put your hands up if you think that's true. And the good news is this, that every corporate audience I speak to, in every part of the world, I ask them that question. Put your hands up if you agree with that statement. Life is too short to sell things you don't believe in. Life is too short to work for a company that destroys the planet. Life is too short to sell shoes made by children. Put your hands up if you agree with me, and everybody does. I say that to encourage you that already there is a sense of common good. Sometimes people have come up to me afterwards and say, you have just destroyed my career. Uh, uh, some, uh, sometimes people come up to me two years later, three years later. They say, I want to thank you, and uh, I'm also cross with you, because one day after you spoke, I, I put my hand up. The following day, I resigned. Why? Because I realized life is too short to do things you don't believe in, and I want it out, out of the company, out of that industry, and now I'm back in the industry in a similar company 
but we're doing it right. So life is too short is an important concept. And the second thing I learned is this, that if you touch the passions that people have, all the passions, they will follow you to the ends of the earth. How do I know that? It happened by accident. My first book was about this first person I saw who was dying so badly of AIDS. It was called The Truth About AIDS. As a result of that book, events began which I lost control of very quickly. A program started all over the country and then all over the world by people sometimes I had never met, I had never spoken to, never trained, and I certainly wasn't leading. But they had got caught by something that today we would say is like a viral uh, communication. But this was before the web. They got caught by a passion which touched their hearts, which they usually got from someone, not from me, not from me, from someone else, and it got taken to someone else. I remember my wife and I were having supper one night at, at home, and uh, we live in London. The phone goes, Sheila hands it to me. She says, there's someone on the phone, I don't know who they are. I say, hello, hi, it's Patrick here. She says, hello, I, Katerina, I at Heathrow Airport, I come see you now. I said, I'm very sorry, I, I don't know who you are. No, 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 she said, you understand nothing. I, director at ASSET, the ASSET is the name of the foundation, AIDS, Care, Education and Training. She says, I, national director, ASSET Croatia, I come see you now. I said, I'm very sorry, we don't have any work in Croatia. Uh, we would love to, no, 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 she says, you understand nothing. <laughs> she says, I friend Milan Asset Czech and Thomas Asset Slovakia. I now direct to Asset Croatia. I come see you now. I say, okay, come. <laughs> Why did she come? Because someone had lit her candle. Who had lit her candle? There was a, a volunteer who was trained to go into homes and then into schools. I had never met him. He was trained by a, another person who was trained by another person. He went to Czech Republic with a passion in his heart to do something, to build a common good for people with HIV, to help fight prejudice and fear, and to save lives. And uh, he lit a candle of someone else in Czech, and he lit a candle for someone in Slovakia and Croatia and Slovenia, and then they lit a candle for someone in Russia who came back to Czech from Czech Republic. He was, he went to Russia, married a Russian, came back, his candle was lit then a Russian candle and a Czech candle light a Ukraine candle. And then the Ukraine and the Russians light the Belarus candle. The Russians then light Kazakhstan candle and then they light Uzbekistan, Kyrgyzstan. And so it goes. I learned that if you touch the passions people have, if they can see the vision for a common good, they will follow you to the ends of the earth. If you are a corporation, they will buy your products and services with pride. They will tell the world for free about all the things that you do. And what is more, they may even work for you for nothing. I often say this, if you are in a corporation, you will learn more about each other in your team in three minutes from one single question than in 30 years of working together. And what is the question? It's very simple. Tell me about what you do for nothing. Not what you get paid to do, not the things you do for your family or your friends, but what you do for nothing. And someone might say, I'm too busy, so I've outsourced it. I give money away and someone else does it for nothing. <laughs> but what do you do for nothing? And I often, I, I often ask, I say, put your hands up, I know the answer here, it will be high. Put your hands up. I say there's corporate events all over the world, in the European Commission, wherever it is, in government, everywhere I ask this question. Put your hands up if you have given something for nothing. You have given part of your life for nothing in the last year. It might be that you swept the snow in Zermatt from outside the apartment 
of a woman who broke her leg last year. She's 83, and she slipped and fell last year in the snow. And every year, you clear her snow. It might be that you work in a church, uh, or, or as a volunteer, as I do, or in a synagogue, or a mosque. It could be that you uh, are on the board of a, a local foundation of some kind. It might be that you visit people in hospital to bring them a smile. But put your hands up if in the last year you have given some time to something you believe in. And most people put their hands up and the rest say, I, I was too busy, but I gave some money instead. So I learned these two things. Life is short. Passions are powerful. And if we touch these things, then I believe we will find the common good is all over the place. It's right around us and inside us. Here is another thing. Before I come on to sustain agility, here is another thing I, I ask people. I say, you might be the board of a large corporation, one of the largest corporations in America. I ask you this question. I say, every one of you, now I want you to take a piece of paper. I want you to write down what it is that you want to be remembered for when you die. This morning, you may have heard the bells. There was a beautiful funeral taking place outside of this hotel. A long queue of people. I imagine someone very well known in Zermatt died this week. And I was moved as I saw all of these people. And I wondered, what would he want to be known for in the speech that is taking place in a hotel right now? What would he want his great-grandchildren to be proud of in the years to come? And you know, people say always the same thing. They want to be known for, well, they want to be known for doing good. <laughs> for doing good. They want to be known for the common good. They don't want to be known for just looking after their family. They want to be known as someone who believed in society, who made a difference to people that they worked with, who took time to listen and to encourage, who, people who were always fair and just, but also compassionate, uh, people who had that sense of a greater good, people who were propelled by a sense of mission, who knew that place, their place was to make a difference in society, someone who was inspiring to a younger generation. They, these are constant themes. I hardly ever hear anything else. This is because I believe the spirit of a common good is genetically engraved into the human heart, which is why it is that Zermatt is not alone. We are just part of a global movement of people who are struggling to see how we can transform the world. I want to look at the four circles of the human heart just briefly, and then we'll see how this plays out in terms of sustainability. Here is a circle, and uh, this is something that emerged as a result of my work with corporations. I began to think, is there a simple universal principle that underpins all human behavior, all human motivation? Is there a single phrase that we can find that is the basis of every mission statement, of every noble aspiration, of every leadership promise, of every government manifesto? I believe there is. I started to think about individual human beings, the baby or the self, uh, the, the individual, the first circle of the human heart. We have four children. And uh, as they have grown up, we've tried to encourage them not to think about themselves alone, but to think about family too. So you think about other members of the family, you don't make a mess on the floor because your mother will have to clear it up, correct? And then you find that they go into the neighbor's house and they make a mess on the neighbor's floor. And you say, no, 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 we need to understand there's another circle here. <laughs> Actually, there's community too. We want you. We want you to understand that, that actually... Uh, uh, we take care of yourself. We take care of your mother and, and the others in the family. We also take care of our neighbors and our friends. And then uh, you discover they start throwing things out of the window of the car. You say, hey. And you stop the car. You get the child out. They run back. They pick up the litter. You take it away. You say, no, no, no. Actually, I want you to understand you're also part of the citizen of the wider world. If you don't pick that up, who is going to pick that up? And so we ask as part of maturing of human beings for them to develop a vision for the four circles of self, family, community, world. Correct? Isn't that what parenting is all about? Put up your hands if you know what I mean. 
Okay, if you have children, you know what I mean. This is, this is basic parenting, is it not? So therefore, how do we know that we have succeeded in parenting our children? Because they understand the common good. That is, in a way, the definition of parenting, isn't it? That they have become good citizens. That they are good people, a good husband, a good wife, a good friend. They're good workers. And they respect the community in which they are. But they have that understanding of responsibility for the wider, wider world. So they don't drive past if this is someone who's just been knocked over by another car off a bicycle. They stop because they are genetically programmed to stop, to get out, to lift this person up, to call the ambulance. This is what we want our children to be like, isn't it? That is part of the maturing. And of course, you could say, yes, but the world isn't like that. Our world is full of people who are really quite different. And it's true that your experience may be that an awful lot of people have not got the common good. This is the great S, and there's this tiny fragment, which is F for family, and community is there, and world is completely invisible. <laughs> now, such people are very unpleasant to have living in your house. <laughs> but I have to say, in my experience, these people are difficult to locate. They are difficult to find. They're mostly in prison. Okay. Now, what I just want to understand is this. These four circles, what are they, what's the key motivation within them all? I want to suggest to you, it's a single four-word phrase. And this single four-word phrase describes the common good, and it is the basic of all human activity. I, uh, I set a competition. I started testing. I thought it couldn't be this easy. Uh, I set a competition in uh, uh, various business schools where I taught. Uh, I'd say, I'll give you $1,000 to anyone who can find a hole in this four-word phrase, this simple four-word phrase, it is the basis of every marketing slogan. You cannot sell a product without using it, and every politician uses it in every speech. It's the basis of every effective leader and every human motivation in one way or another. If you can find a there must be a hole in it. I, I will give you $1,000 at the end of this meeting if you find a hole. And by the way, there's only one prize of $1,000, but I wasn't losing any money. So I raised it to $10,000. I'm still not losing any money. I'm exposing this phrase to people all over the world, tens of thousands of people, and I'm expecting big holes. I, I thought, well, this is ridiculous. I mean, I just thought about it in a hot bath one day. I mean, you, you can't create something profound like that as simply as that. And I began to wonder, perhaps this four-word phrase is more powerful than I thought. So I raised the prize to $20,000 and launched a book with the competition inside it called Building a Better Business. And the competition is still running and the prize has not been won. So what is this simple four-word phrase? Of course, you know it. It's engraved in the very consciousness of Zermatt and was used, I think, by the first speaker in the very first panel or perhaps in your own speech. And it was a, the phrase, of course, is... What is the phrase? <laughs> Can't find my clicker. What is the phrase? You know the phrase. Expressed in a thousand different ways, it is, of course, building a better world. It's building a better world. And it's the ultimate leadership speech. It's the ultimate mission statement. Every product and service is sold on the same promise of a better world. It's a better world for the individual. And you know what? Even the psychopath, he gets out of bed in the morning to build a better world for himself. Maybe he doesn't have the other circles. And we, we say that parenting is about understanding that it's not just a better world for yourself, but it's a better world for your family and friends, a better world for your community, a better world for the wider world. And this is where we wish to go in our society. So the purpose of all business, I have got into trouble on this one. I speak in business schools where, of course, every, every MBA student has always been told the same thing. The purpose of business is to make a profit. Thank you. Of course, we have learned in the last three years that the fastest way to destroy profitability is to search for it to the exclusion of all else. But if we use the Building Better World principle, we understand something different. Every product and service is sold on a promise, the promise of a better life. Come to Zermatt Hotel and you will have nice food, nice views, and a comfortable room, correct? Buy Kit Kat. Chocolate. Why? Because it's always the same, and it's always safe, it's always delicious. Come to our company for a software solution 
to sort out your payroll because we will deliver on time and you won't lose your job. Building a better world. Every product is sold on a promise. Therefore, the moral purpose of every business is very simple, which is to d deliver on your word. If you have said that the software will, d will save me from losing my job and will work, then make sure it works. If you sold me a car that you say is safe, make sure the brakes work. If you sold me some food that is supposedly safe, make sure it doesn't poison me. Keep your promise. And every, every purpose, therefore, is about delivering on the promise. And when you do that, because it's so unusual, you get rewarded with profit. And we've seen this all over the world, that companies that consistently deliver on their promise as their moral code do well. They charge more, they have more profitability than other corporations. Why? Because they deliver exactly what the customer is looking for and usually more. So all sales based on the promise. The purpose of business is to deliver on the promise. Profit is your reward for doing so. Now how does this work out in the world of sustainability? We talked yesterday and today about the chaos in the markets and this has continued despite a change in government. The problem of the European Union, of course, is leadership, as we looked at yesterday, and the lack of any sense of common good that is powerful enough to drive us through to a solution to the current crisis, other than temporary uh, fixes uh, using uh, economic tricks. But if we look more deeply at what is happening and the debates that are running within Greece and so on, we begin to understand that all of human history has been driven by a word, one word, which perhaps is more significant than the events themselves, and it's, it is, of course, what is it? That word that drives human history, it's connected with that sense of the common good, it's connected with building a better world. The word is emotion. It's the passions that we have. If you think that the First World War was an emotional consequence, it was a reaction to a single bullet, a single death, and led directly in some ways to the Second World War. If you think that whether Greece stays in or out of the Euro, I promise you, is not an issue of economics. It's an issue primarily of emotion. Uh, whether, whether Germany agrees to printing a whole load more Euros, yes, the economic issue is there, but it's also an emotional issue. Because in Germany, of course, there is a powerful memory of what happened in the early 1920s through printing money. And the fear of hyperinflation uh, destroying our world again or leading to, to great challenges again. Emotion is fundamental to understanding the future. And as I say, if we tap into the emotions that people have, they will follow us to the ends of the earth. Now, the reason why this is important is because of attitudes to uh, sustainability. If you want to know where uh, corporate policy is going to go on sustainability, if you want to know where government legislation is going to go, don't look at the science alone, don't look at the technology, look at emotion. And the issue is, we can focus on science, but the science is only a guess about what the world will be like when you and I are dead <laughs> in 2100. But if you want to know what will happen, to government policy, if you want to know whether we will seek the common good in the next five years or ten, we need to look away from the science, we need to look at what people feel emotionally about the science. The science could even turn out to be wrong, I don't know. I think the science is right, but we might turn out to be incorrect. But that is actually not so important in understanding how the common good will be worked for over the next few years. It will be what people feel about the science, what they feel about statements like this, the US emissions of CO2 being equivalent last year to a carpet of gas, 33 centimeters thick over the entire landmass of the world. It'll be a question of whether they are worried or are relaxed about this graph of 450,000 years of carbon dioxide levels in the atmosphere, uh, which uh, the CO2 is in red, the earth temperature is in blue. You have seen these graphs before. They are controversial. We don't fully understand them. But what do people feel about these graphs? And the fact that in the last 30 years, CO2 has moved from there to there 
And the last time CO2 moved from there to there, there was a half a mile, half a, a mile, as a, a kilometer of ice over much of northern Europe. Does it matter? Put your hands up if you think that passions are growing about these issues. I certainly do. If you look at the passions people have, their passions for a common good, their passions for a more sustainable future, their passions which are triggered by this kind of thing, 400,000 square miles of Arctic ice melting in 30 years. I've just come back from China. By the way, it's easy to, say, to, to, to demonize a country. I agree. It's very easy to demonize a multinational too. By the way, who owns 75% of all multinationals based in the UK? Do you know that? It's pension funds. It's the same in most parts of America, in most countries of the world. Most of the wealth is owned by those over the age of 65, or it's in your pension funds so that you can retire when you're 65 or 70. Most of the wealth of these corporations is owned by pension funds. It's owned by you and me. And those pension funds are controlled, certainly in the UK, by people who have a legal requirement to look for the common good. They are acquired by law. People, investors will be put in prison if they do not follow the common good principle in the way they invest those pension funds. So it is easy to say, oh, what we need is just social enterprise and all big evil multinational corporations are only interested in profit. I tell you, for me, this is lazy thinking. As, just as it is easy to say, oh, China is the most imperialistic country in the world. I disagree with that. I think we, we, uh, we don't allow for the strength of cultural imperialism, which I would say puts Europe, European Union and America pretty high on the list. So it's easy to say them, but you know what? Common good, building a better world, those four circles of the human heart, what is it about? It's about changing them to us. And it is only as we change the language of them, those multinational corporations who do these awful things, or the, the Chinese government, or what the EU should do, or what the Spanish, so long as we change, so long as we keep the them language, then we will never discover the common good. The common good can only come from the language of us. Put your hands up if you agree with me. It comes from the language of collaboration, of mutualization, of cooperation, of saying it is us, it's my community, it's my world, and we walk in it together. And uh, as we do, we look at these, uh, these things, and you know, here at this point, something amazing happened to our world. For 20 years or more, there have been green activists warning about resource depletion, and problems of sustainability. But the oil price was pretty low, so it never made business sense. And something amazing started to happen about 10 years ago, which is the oil prices started to come close to where they were in real terms in the oil crisis of the 1970s. And for that, you need an oil price today of around $120 a barrel. So since the 1970s, oil has been cheap. And it is now becoming as expensive as it was. And I thank God for that. Because with every dollar, the oil price has risen above $75 a barrel, my alternative energy friends have started to make money. And with every dollar that the oil price has risen above $100 a barrel, my, Euro my, my, uh, my energy skeptic friends, my climate skeptic friends, the ones who think that climate science is complete rubbish, the ones who belong to huge oil companies that don't seem to take this terribly seriously. Uh, the ones who think that, uh, that this is the greatest scientific nonsense that has ever been forced on humankind. You know what? They all become green activists overnight. Everyone gets there in the end. So long as the oil price is around $100 a barrel or higher. And today I think it's well, close. Unfortunately, it's just around 198, 99, but it's still more than 75, so we're okay. And so what we've begun to see, and this is a powerful lesson for how we can prove the common good as an issue more widely in our society. We have seen a perfect alignment between economic forces, political forces. For instance, with the oil price being so high, American foreign policy 
has suddenly been moving to energy security, not just to reduce carbon use, but to reduce dependency on Saudi Arabia, on Syria, on a whole load of other countries. So we have government alignment, economic alignment, uh, innovation alignment, we have the bottom line of corporations alignment, and we have consumer alignment, because they are looking for better prices and they also want to save the environment. And if they can do both at the same time, and they can buy a better product that uses less resources, that is cheaper as a result, this is good news for everyone. It is a wonderful place to be. It is very, very exciting what is happening. And it's happening at astonishing speed. And let me just give you an example. For years, there has been a big quarrel in meetings like this about how much subsidy governments should giving to solar power, okay? They say, for the common good, governments should be subsidizing solar power more and they should be putting a big penalty on coal-fired power stations and all this kind of stuff, okay? At the moment, we're still in the middle of that debate, but let me tell you a spectacular piece of news. As I say, we've just come back from China. In the last four or five weeks, I was with 10,000 people from the Wind Energy Association in Europe. In the same week, I was with Flame Conference, uh, looking at the fracking technologies for gas, which is also very controversial, and so on. But here's, here's the piece of news. For the first time, and 10 years earlier than people predicted four years ago, for the first time, I can buy you a solar cell, which you can put on the roof of your house, which is so cheap and so powerful that it makes economic sense for you to borrow the money from the bank and put it on your house and make money without any government subsidy. Isn't that amazing? The same has happened with wind. Just in the last few weeks, it's just beginning to change. I think in the next five or six years, we're going to find there's no more energy subsidies necessary for wind either. That's why you see governments in the UK and elsewhere, they say, we're going to slash the subsidies. It sounds like a cut. It isn't. It's just the economic reality. Why would you pay a subsidy to people who you think are going to make an enormous profit anyway out of wind without any help at all? The latest wind turbine blades are over 100 metres long. Huge. I know there are issues about where you put them. I'm just saying the technology is astonishing. Uh, he, uh, here's another one. Um, moving power across borders. I'm, uh, I'm uh, taking part in a conference with one of the companies that has engineered new grids. These grids allow us to power the whole of Moscow from Algeria with almost zero power loss. It means that we can take power from Saudi Arabia's desert and use it to power up the, the city streets in Mumbai with almost zero power loss. How? By using high voltage direct current. AC current is the normal engineering current. It goes up and down. It changes its voltage 50 times a second. Okay? That's what propels these lights into light. But DC is like the car battery or uh, a torch in your pocket. It only goes in one way. It's difficult to do in high tension cables, but the losses are almost zero. It's wonderful. And the costs are falling dramatically. This means that we, when Denmark is so windy, it's burning energy because otherwise its systems will all blow up. It can actually shift all that energy to a country which needs it right now. Um, we, have, we are hollowing out in Germany salt caverns. These are amazing, amazing places. You just put water into a salt cavern and pump it out. The salt dissolves and you're left with an enormous hole. The hole can contain compressed gas. On a windy day or a sunny day, you pump air into the hole, and when the sun doesn't shine, you use the compressed air to add extra power to your gas turbines. Germany is planning enough gas turbine holes, enough salt caverns, to power the whole country for one entire week just with compressed gas. We are on the edge of extraordinary changes. Uh, here's another one. Uh, cars. Nanotechnology coatings. These are coatings of metal around one or two atoms thick, 
which transform the properties of every moving thing that you have. Inside a car, it can reduce the energy cost by 5 or 6 or 7% at almost zero cost to the manufacturer, zero cost to you. Here's another thing. Uh, recycling, I'll come to in a moment. Put your hands up if you know you will have to replace your refrigerator in your kitchen in the next 20 years. Right. Now, when you do, you will do it with a machine which costs probably one-third or half of what it originally cost, right? Because of manufacturing efficiency. And it will probably use only a third of the electricity. Isn't that amazing? Without us doing anything, without us spending any more money than we would normally do as consumers, we in this room are about to totally re-engineer our refrigeration systems in our homes in the next 20 years. Of course, you have problems of recycling, and I'll come to that in a moment. But it's the same with the boilers in your house. Every one of you here will put a new gas boiler in probably, or something like that, in the next 15 years. Every time you put your hands up if you think you will probably change the car that you own in the next 10 years. Once again, the car that you own will be made with less energy, less resources, and will use less energy as it drives around. The latest car we've bought is an electric car. It costs one cent per mile to drive. If we lived in France, it would run on nuclear technology. Nuclear power, because of course 70% of France power is nuclear, therefore 70% of all miles driven by electric cars are driven by a nuclear power station. That's another thought. Recycling is an incredibly powerful technology. We are just at the beginning of this process. It uses 70% less energy, 40% less water, 85% less air pollution. Let me give you an amazing example in a moment. Most of these alternative energy technologies pay for themselves quickly. Let's take street lights. Did you know that in Zurich, 5% of all the energy used in the entire city is wasted on lighting streets? And using the latest light bulbs, we can reduce that to only 2%. The saving is so big that it's possible for a company to have a conversation like this. They come to Honley Cloud and they say, Honley, you are the mayor of the city. Can I have five minutes of your time? And Honley says, what do you want? He says, I want to sell you something which will cost you nothing. Okay? This is the deal. I want to look at uh, replacing all the light bulbs in the whole of Zurich. We will do it for nothing. We'll do the consulting, the engineering, the rewiring, the new light, uh, light stands, the new light bulbs. Everything is free. And he says, well, uh, but what's the catch? The catch is, I want you to give me your, your electricity bills for the last three years. And we, we have a look and see what they are. And I want you to write me a check, which is the same amount as your electricity bills for the last three years. Every year, you pay me what you would normally pay the power company. OK? In fact, you do it for four years. On the fourth year, you don't pay me anything. And what happens is, I will make so much money out of the energy I save, I will pay the electricity bill, you pay me what it would have been. The gap is so huge, it pays me all my costs, and I make an enormous profit for my shareholders. This is exciting for me. It's part of enabling a common good to happen rapidly, in a way that makes sense, it protects the environment, uh, it's the same with, a, with a, um, any large building in London that is more than 10 years old. Johnson Controls is just one company doing this. You could start tomorrow. You go in and you have the same conversation. And you say, you own this tower block? And you say, yes, it's very nice. Can I have a look at your fuel bills? You say, well, why? You say, well, I'm offering to replace your air conditioning systems, your heating controls, your boilers. I will change every single part of the entire intelligent systems that run all of your infrastructure for heat and light in this building. I will do it for free. Just sign here. And the deal is the same. You pay me the fuel bills for the first four years. After that, you keep everything. I'm just saying we are on the edge of an explosion 
the only thing that is limiting us is not innovation. You know, even if we had no more green tech innovation in the next 30 years, we have already in our, in our hands enough tools to scale up and solve these, some of the world's greatest sustainability issues. And we could do it, and it will happen. I just pray it happens fast enough. And one of the things that's slowing it down is that very few people have yet got hold of these amazing stories of how we can employ people well, we can treat the community well, we can do something amazing for humankind, we can give money back to our shareholders, we can protect resources and all the rest. So that, forgive me for getting excited. But you can see, when I came here, I had a question in my mind. How can we translate common good into practical reality, and you can begin to see that if we can do it in the area of sustainability, then I believe we can do it more widely. Here's another example. We have the technology to take the rubber tires from your car and convert all of those tires there into gas in less than 60 seconds. That gas is so pure, you can cook your food on it in your own kitchen without using an extractor fan. You can breathe the, uh, the, uh, the exhaust, all that's left is some pieces of steel, which you give to the steel, steel company, and a black, carbon black, which is used as a component to make the next tires. It's an elegant solution. It generates so much energy. It pays for itself 10 or 15 times over. And even more amazing, people pay you to collect their tires and take them away <laughs> because it's waste. So uh, here's another one, and I'm nearly at the end of this. Uh, power and food. This is a lovely story. This is an example of the kind of uh, crazy innovation that we are seeing in green tech. And it's an example of common good. So here we have British sugar make sugar. How do they do it? They cook sugar. That requires power. So instead of buying expensive power, they decide to generate their own power. So they go and buy a gas turbine from General Electric. They connect it to the gas. And uh, they create power and a lot of heat. They collect the heat to cook the sugar. OK? Fine. Then they have another idea. We've saved money already on the electricity, and we're using some free heat. Let's use the gas. Out of the back of this huge jet comes warm carbon dioxide and water vapor at hundreds of kilometers an hour. So they put a huge pipe on the end, and they run the pipe two and a half kilometers into Europe's largest greenhouse where they grow tomatoes. And the day they connected the pipe to the greenhouse, an amazing miracle of nature began to happen. The tomatoes broke up. Those tomato plants used to grow 35 million tomatoes every year, but this year, they grow 70 million tomatoes. In fact, I am pretty sure that some of the tomatoes you may have eaten today for lunch came, they were built from carbon that came from the exhaust of a gas turbine used to generate electric power for gas, for, 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 for British sugar. I love that as a solution. So British sugar is in the business of electricity generation, yes? Renewable energy, yes. Growing tomatoes, yes. It does wonderful things to the image of the company. It protects the environment. It saves them money. The accountant gets it. The politicians love it. The local community celebrates it. People are queue up to work for the company. They're motivated and full of passion. It's great, but watch out, because it's not all good news. And inside sustainability, there are also terrible, terrible environmental crimes going on. I use that word, it's quite a strong word, but this is one example. Last year, 30% of all grain grown in the United States was burnt in vehicles. Does it matter? It might. I gave a lecture uh, in 2008-2009 to a whole load of generals and others from the US military and the Pentagon, people responsible for the national security interests of the United States of America across half of the entire world landmass. And one of the issues they had was this. Where will tomorrow's tensions come from? What could trigger tomorrow's wars? And how can we reduce these things? 
And this is an issue that I raised. Why? Because in 2008, something happened to the price of food. And in 2011, it happened again. House, food prices spiked very seriously. And you know the lesson of history? When food prices go up, governments go down. It leads to revolution. And we saw in 2008, riots on the streets of 31 countries and one government fell. Last year, and over the 80, last 18 months, once again, we saw food prices spike. The UN's own, the UN's own, uh, uh, secu own uh, food uh, security uh, experts said that they believed that 70% of the food spike was caused by burning food in vehicles or even worse, in planes. You see, the moment you do that, you create a common market. If this is common bad, not common good. Because food is now in the same market as oil. So if oil prices go up, then food prices go up. If oil prices go up, land prices go up. Forest prices go up. Fertilizer prices go up. There's pressure on the entire agricultural system. And of course, if you are working as asset is, with, say, feeding orphans in Zimbabwe, you're working with communities where 70 or 80 percent of their entire income in a crowded city is spent buying food. When the food prices go up by 70 percent, the parents go hungry and they cannot feed their children. The next thing happens is they start selling, selling the furniture in the house converted into food. They sell the cooker in the house converted into food. They even sell the saucepans that they put the food in and convert it into food. And when you have run out of clothes and, and furniture and saucepans to sell, what do you do next to get your food? I'll tell you what you do next. You go into the street with a whole load of other people who feel desperately angry at seeing streams of people go past in bullet-protected limousines with dark glass who live in very fat and li affluent lifestyles, and you start throwing stones. And you start throwing stones as an act of protest. You start turning cars over and setting light to them in the hope that someone will listen to what is happening. And when someone breaks a window and your child is hungry, what do you do? The answer is you go back home with food that was taken from that shop. And, you know, we've seen those kinds of riots happen across the world. There are some who believe that Arab Spring would not have happened if food prices had remained low. So these things connect together in our world. What it means when we add these things together is this. I come back to the ultimate leadership speech, and with this I will close. I believe that this conference is of fundamental importance to the future of humankind. That the issues we address are fortunately for us issues which resonate with other similar forums and movements across the face of this earth. What will change this world will be a people movement. There will be men and women of courage, faith and vision, perhaps, who align themselves together as something that goes viral, like Asset did in a tiny little way, but something that goes really viral and something that finds a way to connect economic, political, social, and, uh, and the investors and uh, customers all together in one common good. The leadership speech, what is there? The ultimate leadership speech has been used by every, all the most evil dictators in the world and the most wonderful, inspirational heroes of our world. It's been used by people of unimaginable evil to justify evil and people of the most glorious good to justify eternal truth. What is the leadership speech? It goes a bit like this. This is the speech for the common good. There is no other speech that you can have uh, that, will, that will work apart from a derivative of this speech. So let me give it to you. I'll give you two versions. The first is the version of the CEO of a corporation who has somehow lost his spirit. And it goes a bit like this. If I can use a lectern, if I can give me a hand with this. I need a lectern for this. Because all CEOs speak from lecterns. It goes a bit like this. And forgive me if you are a CEO, but um, it always goes a bit like this. <coughs> can you hear me? <coughs> and uh, the trouble is, I'm on next. I'm sitting in the seat. I have to follow these people. So he says, as you can see, we made a lot of money this year. 
We beat the market forecast by 2.75%. Our return on equity was 7.2 uh, rather than 6.9 last year. Uh, we will increase our market share by this by 2.78 and 3.75. And as you can see, on the, you can't even read the graphs. They're so small. <coughs> and I'm sitting in this chair thinking, dear God in heaven, what on earth do I do next? So I kick Henry Claude awake because he was asleep. I say... Um, any advice? He says, I don't know. I was doing my Blackberry. Well, he wasn't. He was fast asleep. I'm looking at over here, and these are the, half of these people are comatose. They are unconscious with boredom. This is supposed to be the motivational climax of the entire global summit of the largest corporation in the world. Okay? That's it. See, I don't know anybody who gets out of bed in the morning and says, oh, thank God I'm alive today. Let's go and make more shareholder value, Excel spreadsheet numbers, and bottom line profit. In fact, I've been trying, I have been trying very hard to write a book. It's called People Who Get Out of Bed to Make Profit. Well, I mean, that shouldn't be very controversial, should it? Because I, we're told, aren't we, that everybody gets out of bed to make money. Actually, it turns out not to be true. I have not had a single nomination for my book. The book is unwritten, and I think the contract will be cancelled. What happened? The CEO is appealing to people who do not exist. They are ghosts in his mind. And actually, you ask him over a glass of wine that evening, and you find where is his passion? You find that his wife died of breast cancer last year. So he's climbing the Matterhorn this summer as part of an exercise to raise awareness of breast cancer. Because he buried his wife in the churchyard last year of that condition. And that is something he feels he wants to give his life to. You know what? He may not even be CEO next year unless he makes his numbers. The life expectancy of a CEO in the UK is three years only. If you don't make your numbers for three consecutive quarters, you have gone. So please don't expect him to have a deep emotional attachment to the corporation. He cannot. You talk to him about his real passion, it will be somewhere else. So the speech he made was nonsense. He didn't even believe it himself. Now here's a better speech. This is the political version of it. And then I'll show you how it works for a corporation. <laughs> and then with that, I'll finish. And forgive me, but you have to imagine there are a whole football stadium of 45,000 people here, okay? <laughs> because this is the speech, and I promise you, if you analyze every leadership speech that has ever been made in history, this is the speech. It's follow me, because together, I believe, don't laugh. This is your speech too. You'll be laughing at yourself tomorrow. <laughs> in fact, you're already laughing at yourselves because you signed the statement in the foyer. Okay, so don't laugh. This is actually quite serious. Together, I believe we can build a better kind of future. For you, for the people that you care about, for your family, for your friends, for the people in the neighborhood, the streets where you live, in the factories, the schools, the universities, the offices of this land, the every street, every part of this wonderful nation, I hope, I pray that together we can build, a, I know that we can build a better kind of future, not only for our nation, but for our wider community, for our global world, for our future inheritance together. We can build a better kind of future. I want you to join with me hand in hand voice with voice, factory by factory, office by office, as we build a common good and we understand what it is to be citizens of a wider world for a better future for all of humanity. And I thank you very much. And if you're American, forgive me, something gets added. In God we trust. And then finally, I may God bless America. Thank you very much. Now, uh, now of course, <laughs> now, forgive me. Forgive me. Actually, pre um, Tony Blair wants to add that as well in the UK because he also believed it was true. But... Uh, <laughs> He was told by his uh, advisors that we don't do God in the UK, which is a pity. <coughs> but more seriously, how does that translate? How does that translate? Suppose you're the chairman of HSBC and you just made a lot of money as a bank. How on earth do you translate that into a speech about the common good? I'll have a go. <laughs> you don't do the speech, the normal one. You say, you say, ladies and gentlemen, I'm proud to announce today we have made record profits and that our share value has increased by 14% over the last six months. The reason why I'm proud about that is because I want you to know that I lie awake at night 
thinking about one thing, which is the pensioners of tomorrow and our unfunded pension liabilities and the economic chaos that is following because we do not know how to look after the older people in our country. I want you to know that three quarters of the value of the stock which I manage is owned by pensioners of this country and all of you own this stock. I want you to know that 7% of the entire value of every pension fund in this country is my stock, this stock. And I lie awake at night every day wondering how to protect that enormous weight of responsibility and trust. And that is why I'm pleased to tell you that we have defied the market, that despite the market going down by 14%, our stock value increased. I'm making this up, of course. Stock value increased by 14%, and it doesn't stop there. The other thing that I lie awake at night about is this. It's not just the protection of the wealth of future generations. It's a time when it's very difficult to know what on earth to do with the money that we have, other than keep it under a mattress. But I'm also deeply concerned about the poverty in this country, especially amongst people who can't afford to work and haven't got the strength, uh, can't, haven't got the strength to work. They should have retired a long time ago, but they can't afford to do so. And it is my job to not only protect their financial future, but to provide for them in their financial present. And I'm pleased to tell you that we are making a record dividend this year, and we intend to do the same next year and the year after, because we know that there are many people in this country who simply cannot wait. And that is why we've protected the profits. And I want you to know it's been very painful for us to do that. We've had to make huge redundancies. As you know, we were heavily criticised. We made 14,000 people redundant in one area alone. We moved a whole load of call centres to India. We were very criticised for that too. I want you to know why we did it. We did it because it was the right thing. We did it to save money. Why was that? Because it wasn't our money we were saving. It was your mother's money. It was your pension fund's money. We have a responsibility to be efficient and good stewards of the money that we have. And I want you to know that we created jobs in India wherever we went. And wherever we've opened a call centre, we've opened clinics and schools and low-cost housing, and we're committed to social equity in India, working in partnership with local government. I'm proud of every call centre we've created there. And where we've had to make losses, and it's been painful to do so, we've had a big social responsibility to re-engineer careers, to provide advice, to get behind people, and do all we possibly can to ease that transition into the next phase of their lives. So it's not been easy. These are difficult times. But I want you to know, too, that the reason why we've been profitable is because we put our customers first, our service has been absolutely outstanding, according to all the surveys. The, the viral networks have done the selling for us. We are trusted as one of the few banks that's going to be here to stay. Uh, they trust us that we keep our word. I want you to know, too, that the future wealth of this country will be small businesses, small enterprises, social enterprises, call you what you like. And this year, we personally funded and we advised uh, over half a million people in the setting up of their own businesses. And we made business loans to help seed the creation of over 150,000 new companies, which we estimate are now employing a million people across the face of this country. I'm proud of what we do. Countries need banks. Banks are as important to our security and our future as the National Health Service and as schools. And I know that from my work in Zimbabwe. When you see people who are unbanked, who keep all their wealth under their pillow, who don't know whether the bank will survive or not, who don't know whether if they make a transfer to their mother, the money might not be stolen in the banking system. I tell you, we need banks. So I'm proud to leave one of the best banks I believe that there is, and I thank you for your support. Thank you very much. Now, that is a better world speech. And it's a speech actually about the common good. It was a speech it laced in there. It was about social welfare in India. It was about a redistribution of, of wealth. It was about job creation in emerging countries. It was about putting things back. It was about being socially responsible. It was about treating people decently. And that, I believe, is our guiding principle. And as we do that, as we find ways to align economic, political, social, uh, consumer, uh, environmental, all of these issues come together, I believe that this common good movement will become part of a mighty, mighty people movement that will help change our future and redeem the present for future generations to come. Thank you very much. <coughs>